This is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. Though I didn't realize it at the time, many of the interviews that I've recorded for you to wrap up the 2018 season have something in common. In very unique ways, we meet photographers who go to extraordinary lengths to create their work. We can often think of photography as a relatively simple thing. I mean, all you have to do is press a button or tap a screen and you've got a picture. The people I'm talking about, however, make commitments that go beyond the mechanics of just taking a picture. These are people who are committed to a vision, a story, or a purpose for their work. When I interviewed photographer Jim Harrington 10 years ago, he had already begun his project, The Climbers. At the time, he had mentioned a personal project that he was working on, but we didn't include it in the discussion. But the project, which spanned nearly two decades, was completed and images compiled in a beautiful and stunning book that was released last year. His portraits of adventurers, who as climbers were some of the first to climb the world's highest and most treacherous peaks, these were the people who inspired generations of sports climbers. Going back to climbers who established their reputation as far back as the 20s, Jim has been on his own track to create a body of work that at any point could have failed because of money, time, logistics, and even mortality. But just like his subjects, Jim was able to achieve something extraordinary and beat the odds. Because he began this project before the age of the internet, he had to reach out to subjects the old-fashioned way and hope that he would be able to connect with them and convince them to be part of the project. You know, I'd get these little pieces of paper from someone with an address, and I would write a handwritten note to Europe and maybe wait a month or two whenever I got a reply that may come back in Italian, and I would have to get someone to translate it and find out, no, my uncle died, or I'm alive, yeah, come on over. So, you know, just that kind of stuff, just the basic getting in contact before the internet took off, uh, took a lot of time and, uh, and money to travel to these places. You know, I've um, definitely had a roller coaster financial career as a photographer. So uh, I had to do these things when I was somewhere. You know, if I happened to go over to Europe on a job, then I would try to dive in and see if I could dig up somebody, hopefully not literally, while I was there. An avid climber himself, his research and his conversations with people gave him an appreciation for the risks that these people took on their climbs. Though we live in an age of high-tech climbing gear, these people braved their climbs and their lives with equipment that was less advanced and wasn't always reliable. Well, it's horrifying. I've been on some of the routes they've done with um, more modern gear. And, you know, it's common for climbers when they're on a route like that that has been put up by a, somebody way back then. Just imagine wearing hobnail boots <clears throat> and wearing a hemp rope tied around your waist in a bowline on a coil, not... Um, yeah, uh, you know, the gear was very far apart, you know, your protection points that might be a piton. I mean, some of these very difficult routes were protected with one piton in a hundred feet of climbing. And nowadays there's very specialized gear you can put in as you climb, uh, that, you know, hopefully will catch you if you fall, maybe, maybe not, but still compared to these guys, you know, climbing a north face of the Eiger back in the 40s or 30s with just terrible gear, um, it, it was truly something. I'm still amazed to think of the kind of climbing they were doing with uh, next to no protection. We'll talk to Jim about the many ups and downs of seeing a project through after 20 years and how a crushing disappointment became the best thing that could have happened. Welcome to the candid frame. The 
Well, Jim, welcome back to The Candid Frame 10 years later. Yeah, it's nice to talk to you again. <laughs> it's, Thanks for having me. It's amazing. I, I rarely go back to older episodes, and uh, it was really like a trip on a time machine to listen to, to, to myself in, the, in an interview. Because once I have it in the can, I don't look back. <laughs> <laughs> Same here, but once we talked, I did listen to a few seconds of our talk, and uh, man, so much has changed since then. Couldn't listen to myself for much more than that. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, this book is very different from the work that we discussed the first time around. And reading your introduction to the book is really fascinating to find out a facet of your life that I was completely unaware of it at the time, and, and that's your affinity for, for, for climbing in the, out, in the outdoors. And I want to start off with that story that you have in the introduction of when you were a kid, when you would visit the store that sold climbing equipment and how you would sort of just indulge yourself in all the different equipment and gear. I love that part of your story. Tell me about your fascination and about those moments that you had in those stores. Well, you know, I think I mentioned in that piece in the book that I wrote that um, when I was a kid, my father had all these life magazines laying around from the 30s and 40s. You know, that really turned me on to a lot of different things, seeing pictures of the world, you know, this really graphic black and white photography. And I'm sure it was probably there that I first saw some heroic photos of someone on the top of uh, Mont Blanc or somewhere in the Alps waving an ice axe. And I was a very active kid. I had a lot of energy, but I wasn't necessarily into team sports. But I knew I wanted to do something outdoors with all that energy. And suddenly just seeing that first photo really clicked something in my brain. But there I was in little Salisbury, North Carolina, and obviously too young to really get out and meet people. So I had this really frustrating leaning that I couldn't really satisfy for quite a few years. I could look at photographs once in a while. We're talking about the late 60s into the early 70s when I was quite young. And yeah, you know, once I kind of figured out where the climbing store was, I would ride my bike over and loiter <laughs> sniffing the equipment, looking through some of the books, and, you know, really kind of paid my dues in that way before I finally got outside and did it. And, and climbing isn't what it is now, you know, where it's a really popular pastime among a real diverse and wide uh, age group of people. At the time, it was a fairly unique niche. Um, well, yeah, even when I started out, I first tied into a rope in 1976 when I was 13. And even then, yeah, it was quite a niche activity, I would say. But, uh, you know, I was really interested in these people that I'd been reading about who were climbing in the 20s, 30s, 40s. And, you know, it must have been so far off the, the radar of the common man back then, for sure. What do you think fascinated you um, about their adventures, if you can point to one or two things that, you know, when you would read the books about them and their stories and see the photographs, what was it that captivated your young imagination? Well, I think it was just the activity in general. It seemed to include a lot of things that I was already had a, you know, an early interest in. It was a very aesthetic activity where you could be outdoors in a very interesting looking terrain especially in the vertical realm, you know, it's kind of like a abstract expressionist painting. If mm. you look at some of these massive walls, you know, there was a skill and a craft to learn uh, with some, you know, very odd tools and techniques that you had to learn and master. There was travel and adventure. And there was this great literary tradition. You know, once I started realizing there were these books going back to the Victorian age, wonderful maps and graphics and paintings and photographs. So all these things that I was kind of interested in anyway seemed to really be tied up in this activity. And then once I started, you know, reading more about the individuals who were who were taking part, you know, they were all just fascinating to me in the French Alps in the 30s and 20s and stuff like that. I, I couldn't get enough. But, you know, again, this is way before the internet and I, in small town North Carolina. So there would be a few books in the public library and maybe come across some old black and white stock photo in, in the encyclopedia. 
But, you know, it was drips and drabs that I was exposed to this, but I loved every drip. Yeah, we're we're pretty much the the same age, but I didn't grow up in that part of the country. But I I imagine, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, that maybe part of the fascination was growing up in a community which was still primarily built around conformity and reading about people who didn't want to conform, that did not want to accept what was considered possible or impossible and pushed you know, against those walls and brought them down in a really amazing but very vigil way. Was that part of the fascination? Well, I didn't know it then, but as I look back, I obviously had a problem with conformity and authority (laughs) from the very beginning. And if you look at my interest in, well, my interest in music, which I documented a lot, is quite varied. But, you know, there was a lot of rock and roll nonconformists that interested me and filmmakers and these climbers. You know, I think it very much was a very outsider kind of activity, which, you know, I don't feel like I've always gone out looking for those things. But, it, you know, I obviously have ended up there more often than not. So, yeah, I think that was attractive. Yeah. You've been working on this this project, The Climbers, which uh, is being published is, is this beautiful collection of photographs of climbers going back to the, um, the 30s. And, 20s. So 20s. 1920s. And, so, was about as far back as I could go that anyone was still alive. Yeah. So you've been working on this for, what, 12 years? No, uh, the book came out last uh, exactly one year ago, and the project from the first photograph to the publication date was 19 years, just about two decades. Oh, wow. So how did this idea come to mind, and did you have any idea that this was going to be as long of a project as it turned out to be? You know, I start these things. I'm not such an organized person. Um, I'm attracted to things like the kind of lifelong documentation of music and these other characters that I've done. Uh, You know, I was a climber and early on I'd been exposed to and interested in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And that's where a lot of the people I read about, especially, uh, had climbed in the 20s and 30s. And I knew some history about them. And at some point in the mid 90s, I discovered that two of the oldest guys were still alive that had climbed with someone even older that died in the 70s, Norman Clyde, this really interesting figure in Sierra climbing going back to the teens. But Glenn Dawson and Jules Eichhorn were on the first ascent of the east face of Mount Whitney in 1931, although they'd been climbing in the 20s. And I just wanted to go photograph them. You know, I've always had this need to document and and find people, not thinking if there's a project down the road. But so I wanted to go find these two guys and I found them and photographed them. And from there, I thought, well, maybe I'll find a couple more. And I started, as I was getting into this, finding out some others were alive. And it proceeded. And so I thought at some point, well, maybe this is a little tight pamphlet of Sierra Nevada <laughs> legends. And I kept getting more. And then I thought, well, maybe there's, you know, there's a little gallery show. Maybe there's a little series here. But it just kept going. And then I got uh, Bradford Washburn, who had founded the Boston Science Museum, had explored the Alaska ranges back in the 30s and 40s. Great photographer, by the way. His aerial mountainscapes are incredible, shooting on 8x10 roll film camera. And once I got him, it became an American project. So it had kind of left the realm of the Sierra Nevada, had become Americans. And then once I got Ricardo Cassin in Italy, who was 100 years old and died a week after I photographed him, it became international. And slowly I started realizing I had, uh, I guess, a responsibility, but definitely an interest to, to get these guys before they all left. It's, it's really sort of a fascinating introduction, at least for me, of that world, because I've seen, you know, climbing magazines and I've seen the YouTube videos with the free climbers and sort of thing. But for the most part, you know, my imagination, it's, it's a fairly recent thing, but you demonstrate how far back it went. And what's really phenomenal about what these guys accomplished is that they didn't have the high-tech equipment and gear the, that people today use. These guys were just short of working with sticks and stones when it came to, you know, climbing these climbing these mountains. Describe to us, you know, the that reality and the challenges these guys faced when they were making these record-breaking uh, ascents. 
Well, it's horrifying. I've been on some of the routes they've done with more modern gear. And, you know, it's common for climbers when they're on a route like that that has been put up by a, somebody way back then. Just imagine wearing hobnail boots and wearing a hemp rope tied around your waist in a bowline on a coil knot. Yeah, uh, you know, the gear was very far apart. You know, your protection points that might be a piton. I mean, some of these very difficult routes were protected with one piton in a hundred feet of climbing. And nowadays, there's very specialized gear you can put in as you climb that, you know, hopefully will catch you if you fall. Maybe, maybe not. But still, compared to these guys, you know, climbing a north face of the Eiger back in the 40s or 30s with just terrible gear, it, it was truly something. I'm still amazed to think of the kind of climbing they were doing with next to no protection. I mean, especially the hemp ropes would, you know, fall or or they would break under the kind of falls that climbers routinely take today, knowing they'll be caught, you know, 30, 40 foot falls and they know the gear is going to hold. You couldn't fall like that. The, The gear would come out or the rope would snap. And there was an old dictum, the leader must not fall. Because the leader's the one doing the really hard climbing first. He's going out above the protection points, and there's a lot more at stake. The follower, climbers are on ropes of two, so the followers got a bit easier. But, yeah, the leader must not fall, and it was truly the case back then. As you had the chance to meet these people, what insight did you gain about the kind of characters these guys were? Because, you, you as you said, you photograph people who came from different generations and periods of, of climbing. What did you learn about not just individu- these men individually, but as a collective group of adventurers? Well, they really are from across the spectrum of, you know, poor people, rich people, and around the world. I ended up going all over the world getting these people. But there is a, um, a very individualistic type of person that gets into this kind of endeavor. I think especially back then, again, I mean, it was hard enough for me to get exposed to things and do climbing in the 70s in North Carolina, but imagine the 20s or 30s. There just weren't that many people around the world into it. I mean, I probably have more climbing friends overall now than there were total climbers back in the (laughs) 20s and 30s around the world. So, well, you know, a lot of people have asked me, you know, because, you know, a lot of people know that I've shot these musicians and rock and rollers. And they said, what is the uh, similar? Is there any similarity to these? They seem so different. But, you know, they're rock and rollers in the 50s. You know, they were burning their records. They were very outside the, the realm of normalcy back then. They were outsiders, greasy hair, playing rock and roll, dressing very different. And it must have been the same for the climbers who... who uh, you know, going off, it's very expensive to travel and to do this useless activity of climbing mountains. I, you know, I saw a lot of similarities with me, you know, lovers of nature who were attracted to this odd pursuit that required a lot of skills that are, uh, you can't really apply anywhere else in the world, that's mm-hmm. for sure. Again, there's this literary history of it that goes way back, some fascinating books, and you go to any of these people's houses and they often have the same books you have uh, in their library. So it's it's usually a well-read bunch of people uh, with usually maybe a darker sense of humor. But it's not the safest activity you could get involved in. There's a, and I like dark humor. Um, I think some of those things ties them together. Did you find yourself feeling starstruck with some of these people? No, not really. Uh, There was Reinhold Messner, who uh, is uh, famously intimidating and complicated and difficult. And it took me 15 years to actually get him. But no, not starstruck. I think I've only really been starstruck once, and that's when I met Richard Avedon Mm -hmm. (laughs) at the Film Forum Movie Theater. It's the only time I just kind of quaked in my shoes. <laughs> but, you know, as you, as you said, you know, this was a long-term project, and some people you had to wait a really long time to be able to get them to sit in front of your, your, your camera. Talk about the challenges about getting these people, because it wasn't just getting them to cooperate. Sometimes it was just the fact that they were getting older. And Well, you know, I started this way before the Internet had uh, taken off, so... 
with a lot of these people, the first difficulty was finding out if they were even alive still. It's like, you know, nowadays you can just Wikipedia somebody and instantly find out the death date if there was one. Mm. But, you know, I'd get these little pieces of paper from someone with an address and I would write a handwritten note to Europe and maybe wait a month or two whenever I got a reply that may come back in Italian and I would have to get someone to translate it and find out, no, my uncle died or I'm alive. Yeah, come on over. So, you know, just that kind of stuff, just the basic getting in contact before the Internet took off, took a lot of time and money to travel to these places. You know, I've definitely had a roller coaster financial career as a photographer. So uh, I had to do these things when I was somewhere. You know, if I happened to go over to Europe on a job, then I would try to dive in and see if I could dig up somebody. Hopefully not literally while I was there. <laughs> You know, I had no funding. This entire thing was kind of me doing it on my own and finding these people. So, you know, there were moments when I was just too poor to do it unless there was somebody close by. So, you know, I missed people. Some people died. I just couldn't get to them in time. Uh, heartbreaking. I mean, not just because they died, but because I didn't get them in the book. Oh, it's something I completely relate to doing this show going on 13 years. And there are people who I wanted to get on the show who have now passed away. And, and I, you know, I hear the clock ticking with a good number of photographers who I've just, from the very beginning, I've wanted to interview. And it's just like uh, trying to convince them to, to do this or reaching the right person to make it all happen. You know, and, and well, I will being, say, I, I could have gotten, and in fact, I did get very depressed at some people that I didn't get in the book. But then I had to kind of philosophize and realize that this was never supposed to be an encyclopedic be-all, end-all collection. I mean, the book would have been too big anyway, but it's a representation of an era, of a kind of uh, climbing and, and, and the way the world was at the time and all those things. So it's a, it's a swatch booklet of climbing in that era. So how did you come to decide who you wanted to, to include in it? Well, uh, number one, they had to be alive. And I really was looking for the oldest ones first because obviously the, their clocks were ticking faster than any, anyone else. Um, in the beginning, it was that Sierra Nevada kind of fetish that I had. It was strictly that. But once I started broadening out, I knew I wanted to represent some, some areas and eras and the Alps, you know, the, the, you know, I wanted to get the French and the Italians. Uh, I wanted to get the Himalayan guys represented and women. There's men and women in this book and sort of disciplines of climbing. You know, within the climbing world, there's people that just do bouldering sometimes or just Himalayan climbing, you know, things like that. So I wanted to represent some of the disciplines and the areas within that era that I was after. You know, you have a lot of experience that comes from photographing performers, uh, primarily musicians. And your style and your approach is sort of sort of relaxed. It's not like this big production, you know, where you're having a whole entourage of people and lights. Do you feel that that helped you and was an advantage when it came to photographing people, who, especially people who were extreme in age? Well, I've done a lot of those big production photo shoots, and there actually is something I like about that. Uh, I do like shooting in the studio. I got a lot of early uh, e experience and training assisting back in the 80s with a lot of people like Matthew Ralston and Greg Gorman. Worked with Herb Ritz once or twice. And so, you know, I do love that kind of way of doing it sometimes, but I've always had this kind of lighter approach that I've done. I mean, for every... You know, I'm a massive fan of Irving Penn and Avedon, obviously, but there's always, you know, there's the Gary Winogrand in me and the Deanne Arbus side of me that, you know, those kind of people and all these influences I looked at. So as I guess, as my style has developed, I mean, you know how it is. It's just like a songwriter. You got to copy every Chuck Berry lick note for note until one day you realize, well, I'm not copying Chuck Berry anymore. It's sort of become part of my influence yeah. but i'm not really consciously thinking about that anymore and and i think somehow mine you know i can fit it in a camera bag i take my leica and my rolly flex 
and a flash, and I feel like I can do almost anything. It's very helpful for going around the world and sleeping on park benches, which I had to do during some of this, is to travel light. And the other thing is, you know, I'm going, some of these people are 100 or 95 years old and maybe only have a couple hours at their house. So, and I'm alone, you know, I didn't have any funding, so I couldn't bring a producer and a, you know, it wouldn't have worked for this particular series anyway to do, to, uh, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to do real studio portraits with them. I think doing it down and gritty was the best way. Walk me through an example of one of the photographs in in the book and tell me about, you know, arriving at their home and then how you sort of scoped the the the, the stage upon, upon which you were going to make your photograph and how you assessed it and how you work with them in order to create the photograph that you did. Hmm. Well, I guess a good one for this question is Armando Aste, an Italian in Rovereto, Italy. And that's one where the contact had been um, a little bit difficult. There wasn't much English spoken around there, and I know about three words in Italian. And I arrived on the train in Rovereto and went to a phone booth, and you know I had some words written out, and I called him. He was expecting me that week, but uh, in this particular instance, it was kind of hard to get it really dialed in. So I called him from a few blocks away, and uh, he understood that it was me. And he's, you know, he's 88 years old, I think. So I show up on his front door with my little camera bag. I go in, and he speaks no English, basically. And, you know, you can't come in being real photo shooty. You, you know, these people are older from a very different generation, so you have to, and he doesn't know who the hell I am. And so, you know, there's a comfort level you have to get together and some trust. And you got to hang out for a bit. But at the same time, you're seeing the shadows creep up the wall and the days going on and the light. Oh, the other thing is, like, does this suck or not? I mean, sometimes you just walk into a place and it's like, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. It's just terrible. And it's getting dark. It's frightening because you've gone a long way. And probably, in my case, spent your last dime, and I'm not exaggerating. And it just looks like you're going to blow it. But with Armando, I guess the sort of mini point here is, like, what a great rewarding day you can actually spend with someone if you don't speak the same language. We uh, we had laughs, had some poignant moments, and we got some great photos. We had lunch together, and it was just the two of us, and we didn't speak a lick of the other one's language. I love so. moments like that. It just, uh, you know, in this beautiful village. Yeah, there's so many moments like that that were just fantastic. Thanks to the many people who have committed to be new Patreon supporters. We are almost halfway to our goal of 100 new reoccurring supporters for the show. As of this recording, we are just five people away from 50 new contributors who are helping us to sustain and grow the candid frame. The audience for the show has grown considerably over the past year, and I attribute that to you, the people who have helped spread the word and let others know what a special thing we have here. I receive messages all the time from people who tell me how much the show has helped them to pursue their dreams which is incredibly humbling. But that's because the show is much more than me talking into a mic every week. This show taps not only into a a shared passion, but speaks to the desire that we all have to make our lives and our work mean something. And if this show proves anything over the past 13 years, it's that achieving such lofty goals is not reserved exclusively for a lucky few. Though we've met some legends here, we've also met normal people like you who have made the choice to live a photographic life, and we've shown that there are so many different ways to get there. If this show is helping you to embrace that in your own life, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter, because you are an integral part of this podcast, and this show would not be around for as long as it has without you as a listener. 
when you contribute as little as $5 a month to the show. You are ensuring that I can dedicate my time to the production of the show, which includes finding and conducting research on guests, recording interviews, writing, scripting, editing, and a whole lot more. So if you haven't already, please take the time today to become a Patreon supporter for as little as $5 a month. You help us to ensure that the candor frame remains an important part of yours and many other people's creative life. Thank you. Because you were spending so many years producing the, the work, you would have inevitably evolved and changed as, as a photographer. But for a project like this, there's an importance to a consistency of vision. How did you take that into consideration when it came to shooting those images over, the, over that time and also just sitting down and editing them down into the select photographs that ended up in the book? That's a very good question. The very first photo in the book that shows up is Glenn Dawson, which happens to be the very first photo I should, shot for the, uh, for the project. It's not a chronological book photo-wise, but that is the first shot, and that's uh, the only shot I shot on 4x5 film, the Type 55 Polaroid, which I used to really love, but they stopped making that. For me, uh, I shoot very wide open a lot on the 4x5 camera. And it would be very dangerous to go and shoot you know, wide open photos on guys that are about to die and get home and realize the film was out of focus. So the Type 55 was great because I could see the Polaroid and have a very excellent negative. You know, that Type 55 was a beautiful negative. But they stopped making that. So that's one thing that changed during the process is I probably would have shot a lot more 4 by 5 had they kept making that film. But the rest, um, I don't know. I think I really, you know, this is not a fashion shoot or this wasn't a thing to get conceptual with or, or fancy or arty. You know, I wanted it to be really kind of an astringent it kind of, I don't know, no bullshit Walker Evans kind of thing. Just it, it is about these people. And I really don't want to bring much into it. I mean, I've got my, my whatever they are, skills, craft, chops, influences back there. But I, I try not to uh, get fancy with it. And I wanted it to be dialed down. I wanted it to make really interesting photos of these people. But... I didn't think I anything that I was going to tart it up with was going to help. Yeah. And I, I wanted to make really good photos of these people without looking like I was trying to. When I talk to people who've worked on long-term projects and that have spent years rather than just months, we've talked about you know the challenges that sometimes they, they face, that there are moments where it puts the whole project at risk that there's, there's a possibility that it can sort of fall apart. And there's also those sort of moments where they just look at it and go, what the hell am I doing, right? I should just walk away and give this up. This isn't, why am I driving myself crazy with that? Give, give me an example of one of those moments and how did you push through it? Well, I had a lot of moments like that, uh, some very bleak, desperate. Um, oh, I had, a, I had a book deal offered to me back in 2010, by a very big company that you know about who uh, makes very good books. And we were in conversations for nine months every day. We had mock-ups, we had designers, we had uh, meetings. I was living in New York at the time. They had flown out twice with face-to-face -face meetings and things were looking fantastic. I was very excited. And they sent me a rough draft of the contract and I emailed them back and said, this is fantastic. Send me the finalized thing. And they evaporated, evaporated, mm -hmm. did not return phone calls. I mean, I was talking every day to these people, Sundays and Saturdays included, and they disappeared. And it was horrendous thing because at the time work was a little slow anyway. This was going to be a beautiful thing. And the publisher would have done a fantastic job. But it disappeared, and I didn't hear back for months. And in the interim, you know, I was sick to my stomach. It was a really bleak time. And I just, you know, that was one time I just thought, 
I'm not going to get this close again. I mean, all this hard work, and it just went up for no reason at all after such positivity from them. So, and I'm not going to name them because I should, but I'm not. And just, you know, yeah, it's been, you know, the whole photography world has changed since digital happened. And I've been riding that roller coaster, as a lot of people have, of just keeping the regular career afloat. You know, I'm working on this very niche project that uh, a lot of people didn't seem to care about. Wasn't getting a lot of love from any (laughs) any direction at times and putting a lot of money into it with minimal results. Yeah, I had plenty of times I could have backed out and should have backed out. But you know what they say, it's like success is like the last man standing if you just stick with it and... It's surprising to me the whole, you know, the thing ended up turning out really great. I couldn't have seen it for all those years, had no idea. It's amazing. That story is amazing because I I can imagine that people were going to you and going, you haven't done a book yet. Why don't you do a book on the rock and rollers? Over and over, always that same thing. And you're going, no, I I want to do this, you know, and just sort of bucking what the expectations were. And that's sort of analogous to the kind of people that you're profiling. They're they're saying, no, I want to do this and I'm going to do this regardless of what everyone is telling me. That sort of tenacity I see reflected in, in your journey to document people who are the epitome of that. Mr. Good Business Decision, Harrington, yes. Um, Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody kept, because most people know the music celebrity photos I've done. And it was, you know, it was obvious that they would keep asking about a book, I suppose. And, you know, I intend that is going to be the next book. But I'm happy things turned out this way because it would have been obvious to do the music book first. And, you know, these things will drive you crazy if, or anything will if you don't complete it. Mm-hmm. You know, having dangling projects is good to a point, but then it's, I think it's a sign of character, actually, to finally finish something. I did a lot of figuring out about myself on this project. It's amazing what finishing a thing can do. But I think it'll be better for the music book having done this first. Oh, somehow. I can imagine, yeah. Or everybody would have gotten excited about the famous rock and roller book and then no oh, the climber book that's number two <laughs> <laughs> i think i think you took the right path who who did you solicit help with to help you make this you know come together because working in isolation is is often the life of a photographer but there are moments where you need to solicit help outside of your yourself in order to yeah. help things happen who did you rely on during these these years to be able to do that well, nobody during the project because they, they're just really um, – when I did start hitting up people was when it, once I got the book deal. Well, I will say, you know, I've had – I did do a show in Milwaukee uh, about seven years ago of the sort of halfway point of the book. And that was uh, offered to me by a friend of mine who owns an ad agency up there, and he gave me a really great show. And it was it was a good thing to get these things printed and see them big. But I don't think I remember asking anyone anything until I got the book deal, because it had still been this kind of secret thing that mm. I'd been doing. Not really secret, but I just didn't, you know, I was kind of living with it. I didn't feel any need to ask any advice. But boy, did I once the book started coming together. Yeah. That's when I really started thinking about, you know, the permanence of this thing. Did you solicit help in terms of editing and sequencing? Uh, kind of everything. And, you know, I, I trust myself pretty well, especially about the photos. But a lot of these things I'd been looking at for 10 and 15, well, 18 years. And I couldn't even see them with fresh eyes anymore. The sequencing I did on my own, but, you know, sometimes I shot quite a few roles on people. I just wanted to hear other people's opinions because this book was going out. It wasn't my little baby anymore. It was going to go out into the public. So I, I was curious about opinions on, on different things and and especially the writing, you know, that bit that I wrote. I had some very good friends, uh, a few select ones just tossing it out, some phrases, some lines. You did a nice job with that, you know, with that introduction. I really liked reading it. Well, thank you very much. It was not easy. <laughs> <laughs> Writing is not easy for anyone, but uh, me either. So since you had gotten burned at that first experience of trying to make the book happen, 
Tell me about the process of finding an editor and working with someone. How did that first experience inform the second one? Well, the first one uh, was me looking. I, I sent an email to these people that I knew should be interested, and they were, and they kind of flipped out. The whole company did. Um, so that went easy, even though it ended up crashing and burning. I kept spending more time in Europe and getting more of these people, and I felt like I was getting near the end. And then the Mountaineers books in Seattle, which does a lot of outdoor you know, climbing and uh, those kind of public books. They've been around for 50 years as a book company and as an organization for, I think, 100 years or 80 years. They had approached me. And, you know, I was still waiting for a fancy New York or London art book publisher. And I said, oh, no, thank you very much. Uh, I've never seen you quite do a book like I want to do, and I'm holding out. But they were persistent, and then they came to me. I was in Seattle, and I went out to, to dinner with the, the editor-in-chief. And uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse and I kind of made them an offer that I hoped they would not refuse. You know, I had this friend back in the 80s, a musician in the early 80s in L.A., and he was brilliant, songwriter, arranger, singer, songwriter, and he got all this attention, and major labels were coming around, and he was kind of punk rocky about it. It's like, nah, it's, it's kind of like the man. I don't want to be a part of this kind of mm. big deal. And sooner or later, they quit coming around. Mm. You know, and it never came back around. So th there was a part of me that thought, if somebody really wants you that bad, you should listen to what they have to offer and, and talk and not be too dismissive. So we, um, and at this point, I'd worked on the project so long, and I had my heart and blood and guts in it, very protective of it. And it had to be, this book had to be perfect, or I didn't care if it ever got made. It had to be designed, put together. It had to be my thing. Mm -hmm. And I told him that with you know all due respect, I just, I'd rather not do the book at all unless it's really <laughs> the way yeah. I want it. And they agreed, and they were fantastic. And so we did it. And, and in retrospect, I'm so glad that first one fell through. It broke my heart so bad when that happened, I, I can't even tell you. But it was the best thing that happened, that... Uh, doing it with the Mountaineers, and it came out the way I wanted it. Yeah, the you know the community, even though it's bigger now, is I I would imagine fairly small and fairly tight, right? That there's a lot of communication amongst a lot of people, especially uh, people who are as dedicated and passionate about it as some of us are about photography. But especially the people that you were photographing and the people that were helping you in terms of access to, to these to these climbers. What responsibility did you feel when you, when it finally came time that you got the deal and you were putting together the book? How much consideration did you give in terms of, you know, the legacy of those people, the importance of those people, not only to the community but to yourself in deciding, making all the choices leading up to the culmination of the book? I mean I felt you know, I'm drawn to these people because, you know, in a basic level, I feel like you should know about them. I mean, that's or, or whoever, you know, my sort of whole reason to go and, and find these people and photograph them is because I think they're worthy. And that's, I guess, my artistic statement or my personal thing is just that I feel something is worthy. Whatever I decide to photograph, I feel that it's a thing that should be seen, right, on a real basic level. So I think just by having that thought, I feel that's my, um, that shows my whatever love or interest in this subject, meaning these people. And the rest is just my whatever vanity or, you know, what is it that makes you so anal about designing a book, you know, and getting every font and every texture and every slip cover just right. Whatever it is that makes us be like that serves the whole project. You know, it deserves, I mean, you know, I'm obviously fascinated by these people or I wouldn't have, uh, <laughs> you know, done this for two decades. So... I feel it, like it all deserves this. I feel like my work deserves that kind of attention. I feel like these people deserve this kind of... They're interesting. It's an amazing world era. 
and and each individual story they're all incredible these people and they i feel obviously that they deserve to be seen and read about what did this project mean to you as as a photographer by which i mean how did this influence who you are as as a photographer in whatever way you think it has touched you in in, in any i mean yeah i've i've shot tons of magazine stuff through the years and you know, so many album covers, I couldn't even count them. You know, I've had my work out there, and I, I guess I felt like I was a bit defined by by some of it. But when you put out a book, and this is my first book, you know, that's suddenly the real deal. And, I, you know, I could have easily done, um, you know, and maybe some future book will be studio. Maybe it's fashion. Maybe it's something very different. Maybe it's very conceptual. But I'd like the fact that this one came out first. It's it's not the obvious thing, and it shows. I mean, it, even if you look at the front cover, which is sitting beside behind you there, mm-hmm. there's. Um, I think it, it represents a lot of the interests that I have in lighting and and the approach to to showing people. Ask the question again. I'm almost there with an answer. Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of. I, I I can imagine that when you dedicate so much time to a body of work, especially over a span of years where you're doing other work, not just this singular project, that when you look at it and it's done, you realize in retrospect, I learned this, that if I hadn't done this project, I wouldn't have made these other choices as an artist, as a photographer. And so I'm just curious to hear if there's anything that you can point to that this project helped to, to influence it. Well, I think it also kind of answers a question you asked a while ago, but... Um you know, there is, I mean, obviously I didn't go out and shoot 8x10 color negative on this job. I mean, it's very, it's black and white film. There is a, as much variety in the kind of situations and lighting things that I did, there is a continuity probably to it, just as far as the syntax of it, I think. You know, and after 20 years, you know, I, I'm definitely ready for some new projects. I'm excited about doing some things, but it, it's interesting to wrap something up and and kind of look back on it already and just kind of see what you've done. And uh, I think putting the book out is a real departure. It, it's putting something to rest, finally, hmm. to where you can really uh, <laughs> close the book, no pun intended, on maybe a part of your life. And I'm not saying... I wouldn't go out and photograph things in this way again because I would, but I think it it shows a lot of my interests if we're talking about approach in photography mm-hmm. with some variety, but at the same time, um, I'm really happy to put it to rest and and begin some new things. Yeah, I, I, that's an interesting point because I, as a working photographer doing a variety of editorial and commercial work, you're always on to the next assignment. As soon as you finish one, you're on to the next assignment. And especially as you have experienced these up and downs financially in, in the business, you know, there's not a lot of time to really, really thoughtfully think about what's happening in your career. You're just trying to, you know, keep the wheels on. And the book allows you that sort of respite to be able to be a little self-reflexive in terms of what you've actually been able to able to accomplish you know it's it's i love commercial work um i mean actually you know i I photographed a job in texas a few weeks ago that was a really good advertising job paid very well but you know it's it's not art it's not a personal project but i love being able to cross the fence and you know use the skill i love being told what to do frankly i mean to go in (laughs) and not think what does this mean not have an existential crisis about everything, just to go in and kind of, you know, use what you know how to do and, and make give people what they want, make some money. I love that. Yeah. And, and you know, I think the job actually came about because of the book, in a way. The black and white portraits, they were looking for something like that. You know, the direction changed a little bit, but I love being able to dip in to that world and then come back and, and get, you know, obsessed and, you know, crazy about doing personal work again, yeah. which I'm strangely enough after finishing the book, like excited to begin another one. It, it sort of has really clicked a workaholic part of me on <laughs> finishing a project, which really about 
tore me up. It was difficult putting that book together, but I'm really excited to start it all over again. What was the most gratifying feedback that you got about the book? Maybe from um, one of the people who you photographed or a family member of one of the people you, you photographed? Oh, man. You know, it, it, uh, the book did really surprisingly, I, I had no idea. I had no concept of what was going to happen with this strange book of old climbers. But, you know, there were things like I got on the BBC World News uh, at uh, six o'clock. There's like a half a billion people in the market of their show. That was crazy. Just doing that, just part of the book tour. But, you know, some really surprising people like a friend of mine in Nashville, who's this very regal, super talented, extremely uh, funny and sophisticated British man who's very much in the music world as a musician and songwriter, but lover of the arts. And he actually came to my book tour and got a copy of the book and just wrote me the most beautiful letter about it from someone who I didn't expect to be interested at all in this. Just little moments. I mean, just, you know, the book tour, I'd never done anything like that, uh, speaking in public. Just hearing from people who liked the fact that I had done it, period. And there were some uh, relatives of some of the climbers who were just so joyful that they had been, or some of the climbers themselves even, that someone had thought about them or had thought to include their family member in this thing. And, you know, typical good reviews, you know, just standard getting, you know, whatever in a magazine or newspaper that has... The whole thing was a trip, man. The last year, it wore me out, and it was gratifying. And for, I think for the first time in my life, I felt like I deserved something. And I'm not talking about that I deserved good reviews. I'm just saying, like, I knew I'd put the work in. There was no question that I had uh, gone uh, above and beyond the uh, hard work level. That's great. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who that one photographer be and why? I forgot you asked this and I should have done my research because I hate to be predictable and I could throw out some, um, mm, boy, who could I recommend? Well, it's too easy to say some of these, but... How about just some lovely, dark, ominous seascapes by Gustave Le Gray? Oh, that's a first, yeah. That's an awesome recommendation. It could have been anything, but that's the one that comes to mind right now. Yeah, yeah. A yeah, cold and chilly day here. Beautiful, beautiful. Gustave Le Gray. Well, Jim, thank you so much for reaching out to me again. I'm glad we had a chance to catch up, and I thoroughly enjoy the book. So congratulations on this one, and I look forward to the, to the next one whenever, whenever that shows up. Well, I enjoy your show. You always ask great questions. Love the Meyerowitz one I just listened to. And uh, thanks for having me. Thanks to Jim for coming on the show. You can find out more about him and his work by visiting jimherrington.com. And my follow-up to my first book, Chasing the Light, is now available for purchase. It's called Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow. And if you feel stuck or you're struggling with making good images on a consistent basis, this book is for you. It's beyond the correct settings on your camera and will help you to see with a critical and creative eye. You can order the book today. When you place your order from the Rocky Nook website, use the promo code Perella 40 to receive 40% off the list price. Check out the website and the show notes for the link. And once you read it, please write a review as it helps us to spread the word. And if you want to keep up with all things Candid Frame, sign up for our mailing list and you'll receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks. And if you like what you're hearing on the show, please take the time to write a review in the iTunes store as it helps our ranking and creates greater awareness of the show. You can support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon, or you can make a one-time contribution via PayPal. You'll find the links for both in the show notes and the website. Thanks to Grant Lawman, John Norris, William Bruce McConnell, Michael and Dean, Dries Smulders, and Camilla Mendez for their recent contributions. I really appreciate it. 
And if you want to easily access every episode of The Candid Frame, download The Candid Frame app. It's available for both Apple iOS and Android, and it's free. Download it today. You'll find it where everything else is, in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at IbadianX. And this is IbadianX, and this is The Candid Frame.